goodbye niece. As someone pursuing a career in emergency medicine and healthcare, I just want to say thank you for keeping us in business. There's absolutely no reason to do this aside from getting attention on the internet. Hope it's all worth it for you. Depth jumps are a very powerful tool which we can use to develop our explosive strength for a variety of activities. Largely popularized by Yuri Vershansky during the mid to late 1900s, he pioneered a significant body of practical research into the use of depth jumps for explosive strength. Research into depth jumps has continued to this day. It is often compared to other styles of plyometric training like max vertical jumps, band resisted jumps and sprinting. The results vary in terms of which style produces the most results, but the key point is depth jumps do produce them. A depth jump is simply an athlete standing on an elevated surface. The athlete falls forward onto the floor where they immediately reverse the direction and jump upwards as high and as explosively as possible. If we look at the paper titled Effects of Six Weeks Training, Depth Jump and Counter Movement Jump Training on Agility Performance, where researchers compared depth jumps versus counter movement jumps effect on agility, we saw no significant difference between the two groups. But the important thing here is that we saw an improvement in both groups, suggesting that depth jumps do in fact improve this particular modality of fitness. While depth jumps can be used over a longer time period, they can also be used in individual sessions for its potentiating effects. In the paper, Acute Potentiating Effect of Depth Jumps on Sprint Performance, researchers investigated whether the addition of depth jumps in a warm-up could positively increase sprint performance when compared to dynamic or general warm-ups. The answer was statistically in favor of depth jumps plus dynamic warm-up. Now, the participants in this study were using heights of a maximum of 60 centimeters. Unlike Chris, who is using a height of 96 inches. Welcome back to Seek Strength, and there you will have seen the most, one of the most ridiculous depth jumps I think we've ever seen from Chris, who is based in the UK. Now, Chris appears to be a parkour athlete, and this particular clip from Chris went, what I would say, moderately viral on Instagram, and I thought it provided a great opportunity for us to talk about the use of depth jumps. Now, in Chris's case, Chris is a parkour athlete and a tricker, and generally, the main focus of depth jumps is to change the direction as fast as possible, minimize the amount of time spent in contact with the ground, aka known as the ground contact time, and this is usually less than 0.25 seconds for it to be effective. Yeah, so the big the big thing with drop jumps um, or drops is you're coming into that kind of collision with the ground, you're coming into that with an increased uh, level of kinetic energy, right? So in Chris's case, he's starting around two and a half meters off the ground. He's then starting with a velocity of zero. Uh, gravity will accelerate him down towards the floor and then he hits the ground probably somewhere around 15 miles an hour, roughly. Uh, so it's not a crazy speed, but it's still pretty significant. Now, the thing with a dropped jump that makes it even higher in terms of the forces felt in the ankles, knees and hips is that a drop jump then takes that 15 miles an hour, you load up those muscle tendon units and in the course of, in Chris's case, what he says is around 0 0.01 of a second, he rebounds and he jumps up in the sky again, right? So if you imagine Chris jumps, say, a meter into the air, there's an amount of force you have to put into the ground to jump a meter into the air. You then add that to the amount of force that's coming from you landing and coming to a, a speed of zero on the ground. And you end up with this kind of sum of forces. So the force you're coming into the collision with, then the force you'd have to have to leave the ground again. Um, and those sum of forces over a very short period of time leads to a massive kind of impulse and energy. And that kind of impulse and energy um, is the real meat and potatoes of the drop jump it's why the drop jump has gained popularity it's why the drop jump is quite notorious in terms of injuries um is that those impulses actually get pretty high uh, they get far far higher than you'd see kind of in the bounce at the bottom of a heavy barbell squat it would be far higher than the kind of catch of a clean during weightlifting um but that's the crux of this thing when we're looking at it when we're looking at these really high box jumps or sorry drop jumps is that this force the reactionary force from the ground the force felt in your ankles is incredibly high and that's probably why he's using it as a training tool yeah so he's obviously using it and he says in the comments you know there is a couple of comments saying this isn't even useful for explosive training and i suppose in theory they're correct 
Now, that might be argued in practicality with someone like Chris, but Chris also said that he's not using this for explosive training. This is a tool to prepare his tissues for the incredible impacts of parkour, free running and tricking. Uh, it's very funny, the Soviets referred to the drop jump as the shock method of getting stronger. And they had a lot of reverence for the depth jump and they typically didn't do the depth jump all year round. Uh, they would do it in several month periods. They've used it across all of their athletes. And if you look through some of Vershansky's books or, or some of the other weightlifting texts, uh, Vershansky has some specific weightlifting texts and he's also some sports specific training texts. Uh, like the organization of the training program and he talks about the shock methods and then using it in conjunction with barbell exercises in different sequences different combinations of these and they typically don't use it all year round they've done stuff where several weeks into a competition for weightlifters they'll use the drop jump and they've shown that it helped improve the results of those weightlifters now typically the results are quite in favor of this when they use drop jumps and they the thing with the Soviets, though, is that we've all heard rumours and there's always been stories, and these stories have been going around for 10 years or more, of the Soviets loading people up for heights in excess of that 2.5 metres and seeing what happens and athletes breaking limbs and stuff. Now, we don't know if this ever happened. It certainly is a possibility that the Soviets would have done something like that. It's not out of the realms of them doing some of those kind of things with their athletes. But we really don't know if that ever actually happened However, they did have a lot of reverence for the use of drop jump training or depth jump training and they didn't use it all year round. They're very surgical with the application of it. Yeah, I think it's an interesting tool because it's a tool that really taxes the tendon rather than the muscle itself. So a lot of time for weight training, you'll get some loading of the tendon, you'll get some stress shortening cycle, um, but it's usually loading or use of the stress shortening cycle combination of muscle and tendon whereas what's happening when we're decreasing that window of activation and we're increasing the force like we have in a depth jump that tendon really becomes the kind of elastic band on the end of a tow rope so it really is where you store a lot of the energy and I think in the case of somebody who's a really experienced parkour athlete like Chris or a Russian track and field athlete who has trained consistently for a very very long time a lot of the dangers in inverted commas or a lot of the risk factor from the drop jump or the depth jump, they decrease a lot. So if you take, if myself or Owen were to jump off a 2.4 meter high box today and try and do a depth jump, we'd probably do some damage. We definitely wouldn't have a very good performance outcome, but there will be some likelihood of, of injury there, right? And, and that would go for most athletes in that situation. If you weren't prepared, if you hadn't built up from a 20 or 30 centimeter depth jump to a 40 or 50 centimeter depth jump to a 250 centimeter depth jump, you know, like if you don't build up these things incrementally, there is a large risk of injury there. But also with that being said, if you don't build up your squats incrementally and you unrack 280 kilos as an elite weightlifter might, there's a massive risk of injury there, you know, and I think, think people in terms of the calisthenic exercises or the body weight exercises will often view things as dangerous or inherently dangerous because of the movement itself, uh, because there's not necessarily a load on it where they'll say, oh, doing something like that is very dangerous because they think just because it's unloaded, a human should be able to do it, whereas in fact, all of these things have to be built up to over time. They have to be trained. Your body has to make specific adaptations in order to allow you to do those things. So the most common issue with depth jumps is people using them incorrectly in regards to the technique. So the technique of the depth jump is very, very important. And the technique relates to how fast you leave the ground after you make contact with the ground from the fall or from the jump or from the step off. So like we talked about, the general consensus is that if it's outside the realm of 0.25 seconds when it comes to ground contact time, you're probably not using the stretch shortening cycle in an effective manner to get beneficial plyometric training. Now, a lot of people, when they do jet jumps, they'll start off from, you know, a bench or a box, which is probably four times as high as it needs to be for the initial depth jump training for most people. And then their ground contact time will be in the realm of plyometric training uh, and a lifetime they'll be on the ground for ages 
So it's very important when we're doing depth jumps that we're monitoring how fast and how quickly we're leaving the ground. And then we immediately cease using them as soon as we feel like, or if we can possibly measure that ground contact time changing. So once you feel like you're getting too slow or it looks like you're getting too slow or you have someone watching you or you're watching your video, then you just simply stop doing them. I do think they're quite beneficial in a warm up for a lot of people. Uh, very, very small amounts, you know, you're stalking, starting off from a 25 kilo bumper and then maybe in a couple of weeks progressing to two 25 kilo bumpers. And it's really the step off, landing on the ground and then leaving as fast as possible. It's not really that important to hit a very, very high height, for example. What is super important is that you've reached a threshold of doing any kind of depth jump. And then after that, you are increasing the speed as fast as possible. And I think where a lot of people go wrong is when they hit that ground, they're there for too long. And then you turn that exercise into kind of an eccentrically loaded squat jump, for example, or they'll end up lowering themselves too low into the bottom of a squat to reverse direction. But ideally, you're changing that direction as quickly as possible. You're almost trying to jump before you've hit the ground. In certain cases, an athlete's heels might not even touch the ground when doing depth jumps. So all mammals essentially jump from the ground from the forefoot and there's some very interesting mechanisms in mammals foots and in humans foots in particular in humans foots in human feet in particular footsies known as the uh, the wind last mechanism which is quite interesting to look up but all mammals jump from the forefoot or the kind of the ball of their foot when it comes to humans and a lot of times you'll see that athletes heels will barely or not even touch the ground yeah i think if you're if you're doing depth jumps at home and you're uh looking to figure out if maybe you've gone too high, like Owen was saying, or maybe you're taking a bit too much time on the ground, there's a couple of things you need to look at straight away. So first thing is, is video these and video them from the side. Ideally, if you've 60 frames per second on your uh, video phone or camera, uh, it's much, much better. So you can really slow it down and start to have a look at it. The first thing I tend to look at with any of these depth jumps is any change in joint angle. So any meaningful change in joint angle aside a slight change at the ankle but if you're bending your knees or bending over at the hips almost certainly you've taken too long on the ground the second thing then is as owen was talking about in my opinion if you're not seeing a gap underneath the heel it's already too long on the ground uh, so most of the time it's just that ball of the foot will just bounce off the floor and you'll clearly be able to see that gap that gap might only be uh, a centimetre underneath the heel. But if that heel has enough time to sink down into the ground and that joint angle of the ankle changes sufficiently to allow that to happen, it's already been too long. Uh, and then the last thing what I'd say is that if you're wearing incredibly spongy shoes, um, like you might see any of the, the kind of middle to long distance running shoes, that will almost certainly slow you down too much to the point where you're not really getting into that fast ssc so when we have the, the the kind of sponginess of the joints where our knees are bending our hips are bending maybe our shoulders are coming forward when we have the sponginess of the shoes all of that will actually really limit our ability to do this um the last thing i think for me and this would be the major takeaway if you were to look to do something that chris is doing understand that this is a very, very, very long road. And that in order to reach the heights that Chris is jumping from, um, or sorry, if you're looking to reach the heights Chris is jumping from, um, I personally think in this case, it's probably a genetic predisposition and that many people, the majority of people watching this video won't have the sufficient kind of muscle fiber distribution or sufficient... Uh, adaption over a long period of time say from childhood or from from kind of that developmental years to be able to do something quite this extreme you can still do depth jumps you can still do depth jumps at an impressive height but this is a clarence kennedy height of depth jump if you understand where i'm coming from one final thing as well in regards to the technique of depth jumps is you should probably have something that you're trying to reach when you're jumping. So if at all possible, have something above the area where you're landing that you can try and touch. So it keeps you honest and it adds a little bit more of a physical motivation uh, to consistently jump higher. Just a little Mars bear floating from the ceiling. Uh, I think just to, considering this went so relatively viral, I suppose, or, or not viral, but viral in this in the uh 
the circles we in. I think we should read some comments because I know there's some particularly dumb comments. <laughs> Top comment, goodbye knees. A classic, 509 upvotes. Chris seems fine. Oh, here's one of my, here's one of the most obnoxious ones. As someone pursuing a career in emergency medicine and healthcare, I just want to say thank you for keeping us in business. You may be fine now, but it only takes one bad fall for you to lose it all. Can't say no one warned you. There's absolutely no reason to do this, aside from getting attention on the internet. Hope it's all worth it for you. <laughs> Hope it's all worth it for you. It's so snarky. It's so well. snarky. 